I work at the, um, the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne um, and uh, we research a whole range of things from uh, cancer through to immunology uh, and development and aging. Um, and that's in uh, Parkville and uh, that's the view over Parkville in Melbourne there. Um, and it's a real, a real pr privilege to work uh, in a place like Weehai, um, really state of the art uh, instruments like the microscopes that I use. Um, and I work in the breast cancer lab uh, with uh, Jane Vizvedo and Jeff Linderman who lead that lab. And we work on a range of uh, problems in breast cancer from breast development uh, through healthy maintenance of the breast tissue, um, cancer biology um, and clinical translation. Um, but as well as, as doing this sort of work, I think a lot about um, my Christian faith and how that uh, intersects with my research. Um, so I grew up in a, in a Christian family and that's how I know God, um, but I also had scientists in my extended family. Uh, so I was always thinking about this connect between science and faith. Um, uh, but I did take a long time to submit to God because I wanted to know all of the answers before uh, putting my faith in him. But eventually I realized that I had to uh, have some humility. And he taught me to have humility before him and to uh, have faith in him even when I don't understand everything and things might not make sense. Um, so the lab uh, works on the breast development. Um, we also work on clinical translation, but my projects in my PhD focus more on, on the normal development of the breast tissue. Um, and it's a really amazing organ because it develops mostly after birth. So in embryonic development, you get the formation of this small ductal tree. And then in puberty, the ends of these ducts uh, the cells in the ends of the ducts divide and they drive the growth and branching of the tree through um, fat tissue to form this, uh, this branch structure here. And then in pregnancy, these ducts bloom to form spherical alveoli, which produce milk in lactation. But then after weaning, the milk producing cells are no longer needed. So they all die in a process called involution which returns the gland back to this resting state. And these ducts are made up of an epithelial bilayer. So it, the duct wall has an outer layer of basal cells that are elongated and contractile and an inner layer of luminal cells. Um, and these are the ones that mature in lactation to produce milk. And the way that we study this is by 3D fluorescence imaging. So we use uh, multicolored dyes to label each of the different cell types a different color. So here we have the luminal cells and then the basal cells. And we can see what their shape is and how they um, interact, um, how they interact in 3D. And we can do this on a really big scale like this, this um, duct here with the luminal, inner luminal layer and the outer layer labeled, as well as the blood vessels that go through the fat tissue and then wrap around the duct. Um, and you can see just how incredible some of these structures are um, and what a joy it is to, to image these and be able to attribute the things that I've seen to God's amazing creation. So the development of the breast tissue begins in the embryo and here we have the skin and the mammary bud budding off the skin in this first step of development. And so what we do with the microscopy is that we stain different types of cells with fluorescent dyes using antibodies. And then we use uh, very fancy microscopes to image many, many slices through the tissue. And then we use graphic software to reconstruct this into a 3D um, image that we can then animate. And then in the next step of development, uh, in the prepubertal phase, there's not much growth. And we just have this small ductal tree. But then in puberty, uh, the ends of the buds start to uh, divide and the cells grow. And this drives the growth of the tree. And here are these tests. 
our terminal end buds, what we call them, that drive the growth. And that forms this uh, really large um, tree with all the branching ducts that travel through the fat tissue. And some of these structures are, are just really stunning, like this um, structure at the end of the ducts, which have all of these little lobes. Um, and we image these to see where the cells are, uh, how they interact and how they change throughout development, but also in disease like in cancer. So that's a, a resting duct. But in lactation, you get the formation of these spherical alveoli. So here is the, uh, the main duct that drains the milk. And here are the alveoli on the outside. And we're saying the milk producing cells and the outer basal cells. Uh, and instead of lying along the ducts like they normally do, the basal cells in lactation, they become star shaped and they wrap around these milk producing alveolar cells. Here they are here. And this is one of my favorite stages of development to, to image because these basal cells are just really, um, really beautiful. So here they are, um, basal cells in these colors uh, and the immune cells here, which is a big part of my PhD was to study uh, these immune cells and how they interact with the ducts. And then this image here as well. And a lot of these uh, microscopy images are non-traditional colors for microscopy because I'm colorblind. Um, and actually the traditional colors that people use, um, I can't really see very well. So I can't appreciate many other people's microscopy, but um, uh, people actually do appreciate these colors as a bit of fresh air and they um, are accessible for everyone as well. So stained, stained here again, the basal cells that wrap around the alveoli. And this is some work from a, a different group, a group in Queensland, who uh, labeled breast tissue with a dye that lights up when these basal cells contract. So in red are the milk producing cells and the green flashing ones are the basal cells which contract and are squeezing out the milk. And this happens um, in response to suckling of the young. And the, uh, the brain releases oxytocin, which stimulates this uh, this contraction. And another really incredible thing about the breast tissue in lactation is that the cells that produce milk, which are outlined here with this stain that's, that uh, stains the outside of the cell, uh, most cells only have one nucleus with the DNA. So this is one nucleus here inside this cell and another here in the basal cells. But in the ones that are producing the milk, they actually have twice the amount of DNA of normal cells. Um, have these, these double nucleus here. And this was described by other people in our lab a few years ago. But my work focuses on the immune cells of the gland uh, because they are very important in, in all of these different stages like in puberty and in reproduction. And in particular, I work on a cell type called macrophages. And these are really important immune cells because they can regulate immune function, uh, they clear away uh, pathogens and also dying cells, and they help in wound healing. Uh, and there are just so many in the body. So they're in every organ and even have multiple unique populations in each organ. It each has their own name and huge array of functions and some really uh, interesting ones like electrical conduction to help the heart to beat uh, and cleaning up of our old red blood cells. And they're also beautiful cells. There are some, here are some liver ones. Um, my point of, like, yeah. So the red ones here, are macrophages in the liver, with the liver structures in green. And here are um, macrophages in the lining around our uh, internal organs and they respond to cell death and damage and try to protect the tissue from that. And so they are re these really incredible cells to watch um, and especially using microscopy to get such a clear view of these things. Um, these are macrophages in the brain, uh, also monitoring for cell death and regulating uh, connections between neurons. And 
Oh, I didn't take any of these images, by the way. Uh, these are all taken from other publications, but um, I should I should have cited them. Uh, these ones are macrophages in a dish, imaged with a, a really uh, brand new microscope that's able to image uh, the tiny, tiny processes on the outside of each of these cells. And the reason why I'm really fascinated by these cells is that early in my PhD, I was imaging the mammary ducts. So here's the inner layer of the duct wall, and here's the outer layer that we stained with the fluorescent dyes. And we found a macrophage population that is sandwiched between these two layers. And they form this network within the ducts across the whole gland. Um, but they're really hard to spot by other microscopy methods because they're so thin. They're sandwiched between these things, but they have really thin arms that, that spread out across the ducts. And this is another view of these to show you just how many there are in these mammary ducts. We wanted to know how they behave. So we did um, filming of the mammary ducts, uh, which is, uh, hasn't been possible before, but we uh, developed a new technique with a brand new microscope to image these cells uh, and watch how they move. So they kind of sit in the same place and extend their little arms back and forth and they monitor for uh, dying cells and for damage. And we really wanted to know what these cells did. So we looked at how many there were at different stages and found that there were heaps in uh, lactation and in the weaning phases. Um, so here they are in lactation, uh, where we have the basal cells, the ones, contractile ones in purple, and then the immune cells in yellow that uh, sit right next to them. Uh, and we wondered whether because all of the milk producing cells die after we eat, whether these special macrophages are waiting there so that they can uh, clear them away because that's what macrophages are so good at doing. So we did more microscopy in this phase and um, here are the DMs, the ductal macrophages as we call them uh, in yellow. Uh, the orange is the cell skeletons that hold all of this together and the milk producing cells in gray. So they're just sitting on the outside in the early phase of weaning. Uh, and so when we look at the progression through the weaning process, we have the milk producing cells here in the middle of the alveolus and the DMs on the outside. Uh, but during weaning, all of these milk producing cells die and the alveolar structures collapse. And then we get, they actually fill up with the DMs and we have a, a label for the dying cells and it looks like the DMs uh, eat them up. Um, so we wanted to know whether that was really important. So uh, we got rid of the DMs during this phase. Uh, so here we have the normal process where the DMs infiltrate and eat up the dying cells. But when we get rid of them, the dying cells uh, remain without being cleared away. And this affects uh, the ability of the breast tissue to return back to that resting state to be ready for uh, the next round of reproduction because as the alveoli collapse, the inside lumen where all the milk is gets really small and they return back to just the resting ductal state. But without the DMs, uh, this doesn't happen. So you get a continuation of these big alveoli filled with milk and dying cells. Um, so this microscopy is really uh, fun to use and uh, really beautiful and um, helped us to see these new immune cells and to film them and then to find the function for them during the weaning phase. And these are all the people that helped out with that research. Um, and so, as you can see, this, these microscopes and the um, fluorescent staining that we do uh, is, creates really, really beautiful uh, images uh, and is so inspiring for me because I know the God uh, behind it. Um, 
and I think that uh, similarly to looking at the at the night sky, uh, this can instill awe and wonder in people. And I really hope that this uh, causes uh, Christians and non-Christians alike to uh, to think about bigger things like God. Uh, here are some more images that are not directly related to the research, but we have uh, here fluorescent breast cancer cells that we um, watched uh, as they infiltrate into lung tissue to see how the metastasis process occurs. Uh, and this one here, fluorescent um, skin cells and hair. And the skin cells have this really interesting hexagonal, hexagonal shape. Um, so in my research, I'm really inspired by the beauty of God's creation and being able to see things that no one has ever seen before as I look down the microscope. Um, and I'm really, really keen to, to share this with people um, because it is such a blessing uh, and a privilege to do this research and to have access to these sorts of microscopes. Um, I also gain inspiration and, um, and perseverance in science because uh, I can study God's acts in creation and, and not uh, just random events, that there's a purpose and a, a meaning behind the things that I'm studying. Um, oh, I already said this one, um, but I do, I do see it as such a, a blessing to be able to do this work. And so um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share it with you here, but I also uh, try to share it with other people and hope that um, that they will see God in in this work as well. And of course, uh, knowing God is um, is such a a blessing and um, gives me peace, especially in science, which is hard work. I mean, uh, there are times when nothing works, and so I'm just grateful for for that perspective that that God gives. So to share all of um, these things with people, I, I set up a website uh, to share the, the science art. Um, and it was an interesting progression for me because I initially wanted to uh, maybe blog about some science and faith things and, and talk about um, the gospel and, and um, my faith in Jesus, but I kind of chickened out and I just made a, uh, a blog about science art um, and started tweeting, tweeting about science art and these sorts of things. Um, but actually uh, where it headed eventually was that um, I was able to incorporate some of these things. And so what I do now is that um, I share the science art on places like Twitter and Instagram, but then I also have this space where I can uh, share about my perspective and, and try to point people towards God in a way that isn't uh, directly in their face, but available. Um, and through God's providence and, uh, and not much of my uh, foresight, this has led to some really great opportunities like a, a podcast that I was able to do about talking about uh, our research findings and the science art, and then also to talk about um, my Christian faith. And then more recently, an article in the Weekend Australian uh, based on this image uh, in which the, the uh, journalist wrote a really, really lovely article that uh, captured um, my inspiration that I, that I get from God. And, um, and then, just other small things like identifying as a Christian on social media, um, which helps people to uh, attribute these things and these amazing uh, images uh, to God and not just uh, to the technology and the research. So one other thing I wanted to mention was that uh, in talking with um, some other PhD students and postdocs from around Melbourne, uh, we felt a little bit lonely. And so we've kind of started meeting up occasionally and trying to get other people along because we felt that while there are many 
groups and resources for more intellectual discussion. There was not, we didn't really feel um, supported as a community of Christian PhD students and postdocs. So we're meeting up occasionally uh, to do this. Uh, and I'm interested in having other people's uh, thoughts on whether there are places that we can find community and support for each other uh, or other people that, or other places that we might be able to, to draw people from to, uh, so that we can journey together uh, through like early career science uh, as we tackle all of these uh, questions like uh, how we glorify God through our research. So thank you very much for listening and thanks for the invitation. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Caleb. Those images are just amazing. And I, I know from a microscopist or former microscopist point of view, I know how you got a bit addicted to those basal cells. They're just amazing. Yeah. And what you're doing is great. So I just wanted to know what, what's the feeling um, that you have amongst your secular colleagues? Do they understand where you're coming from? Or is it sort of something a little that you keep to yourself while you're doing your research? Um, it's not something that I'm really uh, outspoken about uh, in my workplace. Um, uh, they, my, my workmates uh, know that I'm a Christian. Um, and I mean, I, I'm an introvert and I guess that fits with the microscopy job. Um, so I think I think the way the way that I do it works for me, which is interesting because I think uh, it's easy to feel like um, that I'm not doing it right. Like I should be, you know, out there, they're talking to everyone, and um, but maybe that's maybe that's not my personality, and that that I've well the way that I've done it in in writing a blog, God has worked through it, which I'm I'm really really pleased about, um, even though it might not be what the way that other people might do it. No, I, th I think it's fantastic. Um, Kathleen, you've just got a quick question, I think a bit about his research. Do you want to unmute and ask your question? Hi, Caleb. Thanks for a fascinating presentation. I'm um, interested to know how you get your samples. Do you get them from um, cadavers or uh, living women or how exactly do you get your samples? We, we get some samples from reduction, uh, breast reduction sur uh, surgeries. Um, some we get from uh, cancer removal, um, but actually a lot of this was uh, mouse. Um, so, the frequency that we get uh, human samples delivered is, is not really enough to move the research forward. So we do use some mass tissue, yeah. So I'm wondering what, what where does um, that tissue, like when they uh, harvest um, tissue from a, a breast reduction, where would, it, where would it go mostly if you're, if you're not getting it or much of it? Or maybe these operations don't happen, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, they, hop, they happen um, fairly regularly, I guess, maybe um, maybe one a week uh, at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And we're next door to that, so they can come over there. But there is a bit of a queue for them uh, because there's, there's a lot of breast cancer research going on and uh, the, labs, the labs queue up for it a bit. Um, yeah, so it happens regularly enough for, for some of our projects to be focused on that, but yeah, we have, we have a lot of different projects and we can't really uh, spread it around enough to, yeah. yeah. Um, I think Chris Mulherin, you've got a question, haven't you? If I can find the unmute button, eh? <laughs> um, yeah, Caleb, my question is, um, you know, there's this, there's this conversation about um, how we see the world through Christian eyes or through non-Christian eyes or non-religious eyes. Um, you talked about how you see the world, you know, when you're, when you're looking at these amazing images and the complexity of the human body, um, you see the hand of God there. 
um, what do what do people who are in your experience i'm just talking experientially what do people who are not religious how do they respond to this sort of thing do they do they have a sense of wonder and awe but it has nowhere to go or don't they see it as awesome and i guess that might be a question for other people here tonight too who are who are um at the cutting edge of whatever type of thing you're doing where or plays a part but yeah caleb yeah it's a great question and i think it's a, a good question that i can ask them uh where they where they direct that that or to um i think i think a lot of people it's just un undirected uh maybe intellectually they'll they'll say evolution is amazing but i'm not sure whether whether emotionally that would actually connect I'm not sure if anyone else has ideas on that sorry i was just check just checking the questions panel to see if there are any more questions coming up um i guess it's another science question but i don't know i remember reading a while back that they'd say oh perhaps in 20 years, no woman would die of breast cancer because of the amount of research that's going into it. How true is that? Or is that just something that can't be predicted? Um, I guess that treatments do are getting better and better. And, and in the last 20 years, there have been really, really uh, big advances. Um, I think with cancer in general, uh, there are there are easier cancers to treat and and breast cancer really is a huge number of diseases under one umbrella because there are so many different types of breast cancer um, and so there are some types that there have been really great successes at uh, so cancers that are dependent on very specific molecular pathways that can be targeted uh, but then there are others that are very complex and and we are not doing a very good job at at the moment um but there are i mean there are there are really promising uh, avenues of research going on now like immunotherapy um so we'll keep whittling away but i'm not sure that any cancers will com be completely eradicated they're very very difficult I've just got, uh, I think people are very interested in the technical side. Um, just let me, I just don't want to put, put it out of um, order. Have I pronounced your name correctly? Tang Law, is that right? Could you unmute and ask your question? Hi, Sarah, it's Tang Lao. Tang Lao, I'm going to remember that for next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for asking. Um, yeah, so I just have a very technical question, I guess. Uh, since the, the, color, the, the, the images you showed are very beautiful, but at the same time, they're very intricate. Um, so some some of the cells are colored yellow, which show immune cells and, and all these things. And I'm, I'm just fascinated at how exactly um, the coloring is done, um, especially coming from a colorblind person just like you. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so we, we use antibodies to label the cells specifically, and they are towards, um, they bind to antibodies, uh, they bind to proteins, sorry, that are specific to those cells. Um, and then on top of those antibodies, we, we add fluorescent dyes. And so the, the microscopes we use can differentiate uh, four to six different colors. So there'll be blue, yellow, green, uh, red. That's, a, that's pretty typical combination that we use uh, and they are excited by lasers uh, so the the microscopes we use are called confocal microscopes and they uh, shine a laser through the sample and then they have a pinhole which cuts out all of the unfocused light so you just get a really crisp image um, but then all of the all of the data it collects is digital so we that are uh, just monochrome so then we uh, we change the colors manually in, in our analysis software. So I just choose ones, colors that work for me.
I never thought about the colour blind thing, but yeah, they usually are red and red and green, aren't they? That's all the colours of my PhD are all red and green, but that's going back a very long time ago. Um, could I get um, a few people have asked a, a, a similar question, but I'll get Naomi if she could unmute and ask the question. Uh, yeah, I'm the Naomi concerned at the moment. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was just interested in the double nuclei uh, that probably serves a purpose that you're aware of, I'm guessing. What, what's the double nuclei on about? Yeah, yeah, they're really interesting. Um, there, are, there are a few cells in the body that, that do it. Um, actually, a cell that I worked on uh, previously in my honours year is an immune cell that has multiple nuclei. Um, and... They did, our lab, I didn't work on this project, but the lab uh, did figure out that when they blocked their ability to get two nuclei, that they weren't able to produce enough milk. Um, but we don't know why they need it. Um, it. It's possibly something to do with, so because the, the breast tissue has to expand so much in pregnancy to be able to produce enough milk, um, that is something that's associated with breast cancer uh, and so it's possibly something like because these cells have two nuclei they aren't able to continue to grow so maybe it's a way to block those cells from becoming cancerous and it may have something to do with why they all die following uh, weaning but that's a little bit of speculation I'm going to invite Sarah to unmute and ask her really, really interesting question. Uh, thanks very much for excellent work, Caleb. Um, uh, just, yeah, I just thought it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts working in sort of the cancer field. Um, you've sort of talked about from your Christian perspective, the, wow, you know, look at this, uh, you know, isn't this amazing? But for colleagues around you that maybe are, you know, researching cancer as well, who have the opposite response, you know, disorder and chaos, etc. How do you, do those, do people think about those aloud and how do you respond to that? Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting point. Um, yeah, something that I find really, really interesting is that um, even studying cancer, I mean, cancer can be really beautiful. Um, the cell, the cell behavior is is amazing, um, and and their ability to continue to grow and to uh, move throughout the body and survive in in different um, organs from their origin uh, is terrible, but also um, uh, quite amazing. Um, so there's a tension there, definitely. Um, and in terms of other people. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe they feel that that tension too, because being, I mean, I don't work on cancer directly, but um, I do work with many and and they love their work and they find the questions fascinating. Um, and I think I think a lot of uh, people who study things like that, uh, they may have some motivation. They may have a lot of motivation from from the problem, but um, day to day, you, really, you have to enjoy. Uh, the work and the technical work that you're doing. Um, so microscopy is, is part of that for me. And so even, even imaging, I think something like cancer, I can still appreciate um, some of the incredible things and, and uh, about it. But yeah, there's a, there's a real tension there. I'm not sure how to, how to speak on it further. I uh, remember a colleague of mine asking me into the electron microscope room to show his work. And I looked down the microscope and there was this most beautiful cell, like the most beautiful cell I'd ever seen. And I said, oh, what's this? And he said, oh, it's breast cancer. And I was, I was really struck just by how, how amazing it was. It was just extraordinary. Um, Peter, would you be able to unmute and ask your question? Oh, hi, Caleb. Thanks for your talk and for sharing everything. Those, uh, yeah, those pictures are really amazing. And uh, yeah, they really do make me think about God and creation. Uh, 
there's been a, a lot of talk about producing a vaccine and stem cells uh, used in the production of vaccines. I'm not a scientist. I don't know anything about it. Um, but I'm wondering, have you, do you have any knowledge of about stem cells and the production of vaccines and the ethics behind it? Or maybe other people, other scientists here might have an idea that could help inform people. Thanks, Peter, for your question. Um, I have a very basic knowledge of it. Uh, all, all I know is that uh, the, the stem cells, the embryonic stem cells that, that these vaccines were produced from uh, were derived in the 1970s and have been grown uh, in dishes in, in the lab since then. Um, so I don't, I don't know uh, the details and I haven't um, thought a lot about the ethics, but um, to most people, the production of the vaccine is, is quite far removed from uh, the ethical decisions that were made uh, to initially uh, start to grow these cells uh, in the lab because it was so, so long ago. But yeah, other people know much more about this and can speak better on it than me. I think, I think Francis Collins, I'm not sure if you know who he is, Caleb, mm. but um, he's from BioLogos in, in America. And he said about the, the use of um, stem cells from aborted fetuses, that it was like a, a child being shot, which was of course a very sinful act and not harvesting his organs. Um, for somebody else to live. And that's the way that we should perhaps look at um, using those stem cells for vaccinations, which I kind of found quite helpful. Um, sorry, I've just, Gerard, um, I invite you to ask your question. All right, yeah, well, thanks for your lovely presentation, uh, Caleb, but that could just as well have been presented by an atheist. Uh, I, I would imagine that the world that you work and live in uh, is dominantly, predominantly secular, if I'm not mistaken, where people uh, often actively try to put religion out of the scientific world. Uh, and in fact, some of them might even say, you know, uh, yes, now there was a question raised about, uh, well, breast cancer probably will be a thing of the past. Uh, and, and probably the atheists might say, well, precisely because of the scientific developments by man, that this problem no longer exists and there's no need for any divine intervention. In fact, science has eliminated a lot of problems in the past that people died of infection and all sorts of things. And how would you as a, as a very committed Christian, uh, not survive, but manage your philosophical position? Do you try to share that? Do you try to change minds, change perspectives, offer a new way of seeing science? I'd just like to ask your, your response to that. Thanks, Gerard. Um, yeah, yeah, you're really right about, about many of those things. Um, I think, uh, many researchers, especially in cancer, uh, are quite realistic about um, human limitations. Uh, and I think, I don't think many of them would, would tell you that people have all the answers or will have all of the answers, um, which uh, may be a really interesting uh, discussion to have uh, with, with non-religious uh, researchers um, about uh, because they are so uh, deep in the science, um, but still don't have complete faith in it, then uh, then what what do they have faith in, and uh, what's the consequence of that um, inability of science to uh, ultimately fix everything? Um, yeah, in terms of uh, my perspective and and how um, I can interact with others around me. Um, yeah, it, it is a tough one. And it's something that I'm only just learning. Um, and because I, I post 
a lot of this stuff on Twitter. I see that uh, part of society, which is uh, quite aggressive sometimes. Um, and there was one recently, one that uh, uh, MC Hammer is, uh, he, he likes science and um, he, he shared some, um, some new research and, and uh, attributed some of it to God's creation. And science Twitter went into an uproar over this. Um, and I didn't take part in it, um, but I did, it did make me think about, um, about what my part in it could be. Um, one aspect of it is that I do want to be, um, to put my voice in there as much as um, it would be listened to, I'm not sure, but um, having a balanced view of things because most people are very polarized. Uh, Non-Christians might, might be uh, very anti-God or religion and it's not helped by, um, by some Christians who are, who are anti-science. And so being a voice that, is, that holds both in, um, in balance with each other and um, can uh, talk through the disagreements and, and the controversies, um, I think it's helpful. Um, so I, yeah, that, that's, that would be this perspective that I would wanna give, yeah. Great, thanks. I just um, would like to invite Robert, who's just put in his question just then, just in the nick of time. Hi, Caleb, truly appreciate it. <clears throat> just, um, I did, when I was studying theology, I did an elective in the medical school and <clears throat> studied nerve growth factor. And because I was connecting the, both of them, I just sensed there's a connection between one's spirituality and cell growths as one's personal state, they could say their emotional state or the depth of their inner being. But I just thought you might like to comment if you think there might be such a correlation. Thanks. God bless. Thanks, Robert. Um, that's yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I know how to answer it though. Uh, I think an interesting aspect to the research that I do is that um, I, when I think about the questions that I'm asking, uh, I am trying to find um, natural uh, or physical uh, reasons why things happen the way they do. And um, say the, the genetic or um, the physical uh, factors in cells that uh, direct their, their behavior or, or, or their growth. Um, but of course there is a spiritual uh, aspect to reality. Um, and I don't know how that, how that applies directly into my research. Um, I think in, in my, uh, the way that I approach it, I see that uh, God's creation is intelligible and understandable uh, through science. And uh, I think that it is intelligible to an extent um, apart from God, which is why many non-Christians can do science successfully uh, and treat diseases. Um, but yeah, it's a very complex question that um, I haven't uh, done a huge amount of thinking on, but thank you. Thanks, God bless. Just a second, Caleb. I've just got something just through. Oh, great. Um, Gerard, would you like to unmute? Uh, well, thank you. Now, there have been many uh, well-known Christian scientists who are also apologists like, you know, Francis Collins, John Lennox, Stephen Myers, James Twerdy, famous nanotechnologists and, and the sort, and using their understanding of science to, to illustrate compelling reasons for the existence of God, of the soul, the afterlife. And as a result of that, a whole, you know, important place on spirituality. 
do you see yourself moving in that direction? I know you are still young, but <laughs> would you see yourself, you know, being given that you have some quite powerful foundations in 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 uh, microscopy? Do you, would you see yourself heading in that direction? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Gerard. They, they are they're very big, uh, um, inspirational people. Um, so thank you for comparing me to them. Um, uh, I think uh, possibly. I mean, I guess wherever wherever God leads me. Um, yeah, I I don't have um, a, a very a really deep uh, theological knowledge. Just to just to um, like I haven't I haven't studied studied theology or anything, and so. Um, you know, I read books and I listen to podcasts, so I have a, I, I learn what I can from those things, but I feel like those people know a, a huge, huge amount. And I guess they all have different perspectives from the science that they do. Um, and I'm not sure what, what new perspective I would have, but I guess I will keep doing the work that I'm doing and, and trying to show God to that and, and wherever it leads. And I know God will, will work his, his way through that. <laughs> Peter's got a technical question for you, just so you can relax for a moment. So that the big questions can rest for a minute. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. You want to yeah, yep. right. I, I, I'm not sure if I got it right or not, but did 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 you say, or was it on the uh, diagram you showed that some cells were luminous, and if they're luminous, does that mean they produce their own light? Uh, no, I said that they were luminal, which it, it just means that they are lining the, the hollow lumen of the duct. Um, but once after we, well, we, we do stain them with fluorescent dye, so they are luminous after we do that. Um, Michelle. Michelle, or is it somebody else? Michelle So, is it? Yeah, sorry. Yep, that's just, okay. <laughs> that issue is like fun. Um, sorry, Caleb, I missed a lot of your presentation, so I'm hoping it's recorded, but I just jumped on and saw how beautiful the images were towards the end and was wondering, um, I saw you've got a website as well, and I think it's, it's incredibly inspiring how you've uh, linked uh, your science with your faith. I was wondering if the institutes you've worked through um, have any issues with you doing that? Uh, have they ever questioned you or tried to um, say don't associate with the, our institute and whatever you're blogging about? Mm, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, no, I haven't had any trouble. It has crossed my mind uh, whether that would happen at some point. Um, uh, and there have been uh, yeah a few things that the institute has been involved in, like um, the the newspaper article. Uh, they they were working through our comms team, communications team, and uh, they they knew everything that, that we were talking about, and and they were all they were fine with all of that. Um, they are they are big on diversity at my workplace, uh, like uh, LGBTQ community, um, racial diversity, and yeah, inclusiveness in research. Um, so I do wonder whether um, they, I mean, there, there is a danger there that they, that they see um, Christians as, as being um, anti-gay uh, or any, any of those things. Um, but I guess for now, it seems like that being Christian fits in with their diversity uh, stance. Um, and I'm obviously not, I'm doing, saying very positive things and very personal things. I'm not, I'm not uh, forcing my views on anyone else, but I'm really, really glad that they are really open to it at the moment and they haven't, they haven't said anything. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that is the, side, the, the good side about, you know, diversity is that um, you can argue that you <laughs> are, um, yeah, freely able to you know, talk about your beliefs. Um, I'm just going to ask Chris. 
Yeah, I just I was just going to make a comment on that. Our experience with uh, people from the United States is very different. Um, when we brought Jennifer Wiseman out here, she was extremely careful about how we advertised her. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't. We didn't on the Iscast website. I don't think we used the word NASA. Um, the she was going to be doing Christian talks and she was going to be doing NASA talks in Australia, but they're very sensitive in the states, at least the government organisations, about those connections. Another example, although I don't quite understand it, is Francis Collins, who runs the National Institutes of Health out there. Um, we've asked him a couple of times to come to Australia. And his response, one of his responses has been, well, as long as I'm a government employee, that would be very difficult uh, to come to Australia and do a Christian tour. Although he does seem to be able to do a lot of Christian speaking in the States and for Biologos. So um, I don't quite know how it works, but um, in Australia, uh, the rules are a little bit different. And I guess I hope they stay that way. And uh, as long as there's not another question there, I'll, um, I'll mention the other thing that I mentioned a few weeks ago when Ian Harper spoke to us. Um, Ian Harper is somebody who's uh, publicly known as an economist and also publicly known as a Christian. And he doesn't, he doesn't sense that tension between speaking um, as a person who's a Christian, but also a person who at one time or another is, uh, is being paid by the government or currently being paid as the dean of the Melbourne Business School. So uh, I guess in Australia, we can be grateful that there is uh, not that strong pressure, but that's just a comment. Other people might like to comment. There are other people here with experience of these things too. Yeah, look, I, I welcome people to, um, to make comments um, about that. I mean, it's a really, really worrying thing that, you know, it happens. And I, I know that, um, you know, I've experienced people not, not wanting to, um, you know, do something with is cast just in a small period of time just because they um, don't want to publicly say that they're a Christian because it might affect their their other part of their life or their, um, yeah, their career, which is a bit of a worry. And, of course, if anybody's got any advice, uh, we are in the business of trying to help Christians who are scientists to, um, to integrate that, to be public Christians as much as they're able and as much as they're uh, comfortable. Um, we are happy to receive advice uh, on how how we help people. Do. Uh, John White, I don't know if you might like to make a comment. Um, if you would feel free. John was um, uh, one of the founders of Iscast, really, and um, long experience of being uh, involved in the Christianity and science space. Do you want to make a comment, John? Yes, I just unmute, unmuted myself. You have. Good. Uh, I had um, difficulty actually getting a question through. Somehow or other the machine isn't working for me, but I do have a, uh, a comment or two. Uh, first thing, I think it's just wonderful, uh, Caleb, that you have started this group of, uh, informally amongst yourself, scientists, uh, and possibly Christians as well, uh, talking about things which you think are interesting. Uh, we, we, we've, I've done that and was greatly helped by it when I was an undergraduate and even a graduate student at the University of Sydney years ago because there were senior people who took an interest in all sorts of theological questions or rather questions relating, relating to the interpretation of the Bible it was at that time. Uh, and uh, there, there were people who could, uh, could say wise things and... Uh, and uh, help the discussion. So I do encourage you to do that more. And I noted, Chris, that you have put down in, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the list of points that you made that ISCAST is going to give some help uh, in the formation of it. So uh, a formation of that little group that you have started, Caleb, is, is really very powerful because the group together can be, in fact, as I was listening to another talk recently, uh, perhaps more powerful than the sum of its parts. Mm. Oh, thanks very much for your the encouragement. Good talk, by the way. Oh, thank you. 
for those that don't know, ISCAST was ISCAST came into being about 30 years ago, and it really grew out of what was called then the Research Scientists Christian Fellowship. So I guess it sort of started from a, a group similar to what, what Caleb is, is talking well, about. Well, exactly. And I think he should take some encouragement from that because his commitment and the commitment of others that he find can identify and find have a similar commitment uh, can lead to quite large things. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, you're certainly not alone anyway, even though it might be hard to find other people in your same situation. So I'm just interested um, whether, let me just go up here a bit. Uh, sorry, just bear with me for a second. I was just wondering um, whether there are other people in the discussion group who've got experience with um, their science or their vocation and being a Christian within it, where there's been any, any difficulties um, in that, because I think that's a really important, um, well, not that Caleb's experienced it, but I think it's a, an issue that um, has come out of tonight. Does anyone want to um, talk? I have got one new message here. Um, Tang Lao, have I said it right this time? Yes, you have, Sarah, thanks. Um, yeah, I'd like to comment on that. Thanks, Chris, for the, uh, for the comment as well. So I, I was, I'm, I'm a postdoc right now at the School of Physics at the University of Sydney, but I was working at the School of Maths and Physics in the University of Queensland before this. And I, I did have uh, an experience where uh, a professor uh, wanted to confirm with people um, um, some certain things before he invited a professor over. Sorry, I cannot really talk about details. Um, so basically he knows that this professor from the US is, I'd, identifies as a Christian and he didn't want the university to be um, inviting Chris, well, people who identify as such. Well, I'm not exactly sure uh, what he, his, his, his thoughts were, but it was more, he was very concerned about um, the reputation of the university potentially being tarnished by inviting over somebody who identifies as a Christian. Well, he, the, the professor is kind, was kind of, um, uh, connected to the intelligent design movement. Well, anyway, um, that's to the extent to which I found that, yeah, there, there is to some extent um, some, I guess, some forces that uh, want to uh, keep vocal public Christians away from the university science realm in, here in Australia. Um, I, I personally, as, uh, as, a, yeah, as a postdoc, I I, I'm there's a I'm, I'm a bit afraid to be a very public Christian, a very vocal Christian, because I know that there's a ladder to 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 climb, and um, I'm there's there's this fear that something um, will just uh, you know uh, not work um, as I work my career. So I, so on on career on Chris's uh, um, comment on um, yeah. Uh, uh, it, that discussed is encouraging people, uh, scientists, to be more public about the faith, their Christian faith. I do feel that it's a lot easier for professors and people at the top ranks, or Christians and scientists, to 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 do so. But it, there there really is a big barrier, uh, yeah, to us who are still working, our in a sense our, our academic career. So it would be really yeah, nice to to think a little bit um, more on on solutions to that could encourage, you know, early career academics um, who, um, who are very solid in faith, but at the same time are, are a bit taken aback about being a bit more public um, in their faith because of these potential barriers that could come along the way. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I, I, look, I think that um, a lot of people have had those, uh, those kinds of feelings and I'm sure people could to comment and give you advice on that. Um, firstly, I'll let uh, Gerard comment. Yes, thank you again, uh, Caleb. Now, I, I, I would fully agree. Now, I, I myself am in, uh, I'm a family therapist working in the area specializing in addictions, working with Catholic care. 
And even among my colleagues who are uh, very few of them Christian, uh, there is a deep apprehension. And I imagine you know, even in the world of mental health, there's a huge resistance to, to, to uh, against this whole culture of Christianity. Uh, and, and so one has to almost like apologize for bringing in a faith uh, perspective. But what I found to be useful, and, and this is my, my own little contribution, is I, I think because a lot of people perceive Christianity to be narrow, to be exclusivist, to be morally conservative and non-inclusive. And that's why there's this very superficial judgment that Christianity is not the way to go and that if you are a Christian mental health specialist or scientist, you probably will follow very narrow perspectives and this is not true science and so forth. But I think the, the, the way to go about it, and, and that's my, been my own experience, is to speak more about spirituality than rather about Christianity. The idea of an intelligent designer, the idea that the soul does exist, that the idea that we are more than just physical material entities, uh, if we are just physical material entities, then life's purpose must necessarily be a very utilitarian purpose to survive, to, to maximize pleasure and to avoid pain. But if we are more than a physical entity that we have a soul, and, and there's a lot of research, you know, some might think of it as pseudo research and near death experience and so forth, which seems to point quite convincingly about the existence of the soul, then the whole game plan changes. Now, you know, when, we, when I talk about that in that sense, I, I can see a certain openness there. And, and people are kind of looking at that and say, oh yeah, you know, well, especially Buddhism seems to, to, to uh, mention things like meditation, mindfulness, and, and the scientific community is quite open to that. I'm just wondering whether that is useful to, 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 to approach you know, uh, faith from a more spiritual perspective than from a rigidly uh, Judeo-Christian theological or moral perspective. Because I think that many people, even secularists, are quite, uh, are definitely searching for truth. Uh, they mm -hmm. might not want to be identified with what they think of as a rigid Christian model, but there's definitely an openness in searching. And, and, and I believe that once you, you know, they, they can begin to admit that there's more to life than just a physical material existence, then suddenly a whole new world opens up to them and, and, and you know, the spirit starts working in a very powerful way that way. And that's just mm -hmm. my, my, my two cents worth to, to contribute. Uh, thank you. It was very valuable two cents worth. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to invite Chris McNeil. Um, yeah, hi, thanks, Sarah. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm a professor at Monash University um, in the engineering faculty, I mean, I've not really experienced any really strong negative um, activity towards Christianity. Um, I haven't really openly worn my religion on my sleeve, but I think also I live out my Christian uh, world values and perspectives through how I interact with my students and how I model my behaviours, and I think that speaks as well. Um, I think there are a lot more Christians in academia than it might seem. Um, and particularly, you know, I post up at Cambridge University and, you know, the number of Christian academics I came into contact there was, was um, quite phenomenal. And, you know, a lot of people have the perspective that the more, the higher and higher seats of learning you would go to, the fewer and fewer Christians you would find. And that's certainly not been the case that I've seen. Um, and certainly, yeah, coming back to that sort of the diversity and inclusiveness in the universities, I would hope. I get the feeling that Christianity would be part of that through religion. And I would feel that I would be supported by my institute that if I was um, attacked or vilified because of my religion, that would be something I could bring up to management and that would be something that would be taken very seriously. Um, so I think that diversity inclusiveness, I think would extend to religion and Christianity. Um, and I would hope that they would um, be seeming to be tolerant to us, even if they might think we are intolerant, although I'd hope that we would be salt and light in any case to the world. Thank you. Thanks for that. It's, it's good to know that, yeah, that you have some um, faith in your institution that they wouldn't, um, wouldn't discriminate or make you feel like that. Um, 
Peter, would you like to unmute? Yeah, I guess my, my question is more along the theological lines that if scientists are involved in healing life, wouldn't their work be a witness in itself, whether they are a Christian or not, because they're involved in the redemption of creation or this a bit taking part in a little bit of the salvation of creation, God's creation? Thank you. I've also got a comment from Roger. He doesn't have a microphone, so I've got to read it out. He says that... Um, New atheists and the like often seem to trade on their scientific credentials and positions to lend authority to their personal opinions. And I think we see that quite, quite a lot with the, with the new atheist kind of celebrities of the world. Um, I'm not sure if it's a question, but Gavin, would you like to um, unmute and make your comment? Oh, yeah, thanks very much. Um, sorry, I was just trying to actually find it uh, on the KCC website. But uh, John Lennox spoke at the recent uh, men's base camp uh, online conference, and he gave the testimony that when he was a young man in, a, I can't remember if it was Oxford or Cambridge, I'll probably offend him by saying the wrong one, um, that a senior uh, professor said to him, oh, you've got to give up your faith, you can't hold on to fairy tales. Sorry, my kid's yelling in the background. Um, and, yeah, I can't remember exactly what John said, but, you know, he had to make a real stand for his faith there and then. Uh, and so it was just really encouraging to hear what he said. So I'll try and find the link and uh, post it to everybody so you can have a, you can have a watch, hopefully. That's great. Thank you. Now, we've got a few minutes left, so I was just wondering whether if anyone else wanted to... Um, I'll just open it up now if anyone wanted to unmute themselves and ask a question to Caleb or make a comment about the things that we've been talking about tonight. So I'll just leave it for a few moments. I can hear Chris Mulheron typing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't hear anything else. So... I think what we might do is um, just thank Caleb so much. I know a lot of people have thanked him in the chat, but just thank you so much, um, Caleb, for a really wonderful presentation. It's not like anything that we've had before um, with all those really beautiful images. And I just want to say personally thank you that you took me back a few years and, um, yeah, just how much their technology has come forward um, is amazing. And it, they are really, really beautiful. And I can see... Um, how wonderful your days, albeit a bit lonely, um, that you're able to see these wonderful things and it's such a, such a privilege to see God's creation through the microscope. Um, before we leave, I'll just remind you that for those of you who came late, um, this presentation has been recorded and Chris will have it up on the ISCAST website um, tomorrow probably, if that's true, Chris. I'm not, hopefully I'm not giving you too much work. And yeah, hope so. Anyway, if not tomorrow, it will be soon. And um, I'd just like to ask one of the Browns, either <laughs> Andrew or Naomi, they've um, agreed to pray for us before we leave tonight. Thank you. Okay, let, let's pray. Uh, well, Lord God, we believe that this is your world and we believe that you are glorified when we seek to understand it from the cosmic level down to the cellular level and beyond and we get a little thrill when we study it because we feel as if we're discovering more of your handiwork and your genius and uh, we sometimes have the added bonus that our study can be directed towards the easing of uh, human suffering in different ways and so well, we pray that that would be Gavin's future, that his research might not only discover your glory in the uh, cellular world, but also lead to some progress in solving real human problems and things that really um, hurt individual people. So we are 
anxious to see you glorified more and we're glad that uh, such work of discovery can do it. Show us how to be um, proud of you in the world while being uh, sensible and um, prudent as well. Um, not just about our own futures, but our impact on other people. Uh, Lord, we know that uh, to serve you is not a shameful thing. We know that we don't have to uh, conceal an ugliness within. We know that we don't have to pretend to be nice people and really be nasty. We believe that uh, you renew life through Christ from the inside out. And so we pray that uh, our lives would just be good examples of that ongoing work of grace and uh, expand our minds, help us to understand better things about you and your world and express them in fascinating and intriguing ways to other people, including through this cast. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.